Jesus in that pocket, then I won't have to fool with it again. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We serve an awesome God. Oh, I like that. Some of you here are Pentecostal, Baptocostal, Catholicostal. <laughs> Amen. We're all God's children. I love Christmas. It's a great time of the year. It reminds me of a story that I heard, read about. A little girl, she was very intense in school. How many of those kids can really get really intense? Yes. It can be intense. And um, this little girl was drawing a picture. And the teacher asked her, said, well, what are you drawing? So, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher politely said, well, sweetheart, I know that's a beautiful picture that you're drawing there. But you really can't draw a picture of God because nobody knows what God looks like. She said, now they do. <laughs> She showed that picture to that teacher. And it, it goes beyond that. I really like to look at history. How many of you like history? This is a little different message this morning. But uh, history, you can look at biographies and, and look at things like presidents. I like to read about past presidents and Look at the things that's happened. I, uh, one reason why I enjoy, enjoy history is because I like reading about what happened behind the scenes after the fact. You can really get the real story, not just the media story, but you can get what really happened behind the scenes and the events that may have changed the world. And I like looking at presidents. I look at Harry Truman, the 33rd president of the United States. And, you know, he was in a back room one day. And uh, when he was a vice president, the, the, the president had, had died, Roosevelt, and he had to make a decision. He had to make a hard decision. They were in the middle of a war. And it was going to cost the United States over 500,000 lives if we went in and invaded Japan. So he had to make a decision. He heard about Los Alamos and the, uh, the making of the first atomic bomb. And he had to make that hard decision. And America dropped on August the 6th, one on Hiroshima, and then a few days later on August the 9th, they dropped one on Nagasaki, killing over 200,000 people. Not all at once. 70,000 were immediately killed. And you say, well, why are you, why are you preaching a message like that? Because that was something that that man had to make a decision. He had to make some decision, and history was changed because of that decision. Richard Nixon was another one. History was changed because of him. But I don't know how many of you might know this, but he asked a man, Henry Kissinger, to come in his old office and kneel with him and pray. Yes. He asked this man to come and pray with him. And you know the rest of the story, the outcome. How many of you remember the hostages of the, the, in Iran in 1979 to 1981? It started off with 66 hostages. They let several of them go, and it ended up with about 52 hostages for 444 days. That's a long time to be a hostage. And right at the moment, Jimmy Carter tried his best, bless his heart. He was a, this man was a man of God. Yes. This man's a Christian. Yes. He tried to get those people to be released. And the world, the world wants to blame him. But moments after Reagan was elected into office he, in, in, on the inaugural address in January of 1981, they turned his hostages loose. That was a moment in history that a president made. 
This message today is some sort like that. And I began to pray, Lord, what do I, what do I preach on on Christmas Day? The baby Jesus? You know, what do I do? And if I was going to entitle this message, it would be like the song, Born to Die. Yes. It takes us behind the scenes of heaven. When an event that occurred, and you've read it before, that will change the world forever. I want you to get your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 5, <coughs> chapter 10, chapter 10 and verse 5. How many of you believe that the Word of God is true? Amen. Amen. So what I'm going to give you this morning is not something that I made up. I want to give you something that the Word of God says. I want you to keep in mind that we see Jesus Christ in this scripture speaking to the Heavenly Father. God the Father. Now always remember that Jesus and the Father and the Holy Ghost has always been together. They're not inseparable. They've never been apart. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Amen, I believe that. Yes. The Word of God says that. And we hear the conversation here in the scriptures here. Here where Jesus, God's Son, what he had with the Heavenly Father in heaven just before he came to earth on the first Christmas. And here's what was said. It says here that when Christ came into the world, he said to God. So if he came into the world, that means he was with God first, right? That's right. So that means he, meant he had to be in heaven. He couldn't be on earth. Now, we know that God is omnipotent and he's omnipresent. That's right. But we're talking about a scene in heaven we're talking here in Scripture. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, When Christ came into the world, he said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices and sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. This is Jesus talking to the heavenly Father. And he says, If you are not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, then I said, Look, and this is the important thing that, God, that Jesus said to his father. I have come to do your will, O oh God. Yes. And it's written about me in the scriptures. I have come to do your will. Christ came into the world as a baby, as an infant, born of a human, of a virgin mother. So before he came in the world, here we see in the scriptures here, Jesus is with his Father in heaven. I want to make this real clear. This is awesome. And here he is, he's saying, I'm going to leave heaven because you've made a sacrifice through me and you've given, made me a, given me a body and I'm going to be that sacrifice once and for all. These other blood sacrifices weren't worthy enough. They all pointed to Jesus anyway. All the other sacrifices, the blood and the animal sacrifices, all pointed to him anyway in the beginning. And it says, here we see that these past sacrifices of animals and pointed to Jesus who, who was to come. And we see that here's what Jesus said. He said, okay, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared to be. The very Son of God, Jesus Christ, volunteered to leave heaven. He, how many of you remember the song, Just Propose, he, God Searched Through Heaven and Couldn't Find One Willing to Be? Yes. That supreme sacrifice that was needed to buy eternal life for you and me. Thank God. I remember, how many of you remember that song? That's an old song. He said, I understand, Lord, God. I understand what the mission is. I really do. And sacrifices were not able to change things. So this is what the Son of God said himself. He said, you prepared a body for me. You prepared a body. And what Jesus said, he said, I'm coming to the earth. I am coming because I have a knowledge of my destination. I have a knowledge of why I'm coming. He was coming to suffer and die for all mankind, for you and me, Tanya. Yeah. How many times have I told you that? <laughs> a lot of times, huh? How many times have you told me that? From the cradle to the cross, and from the cross to the tomb, from the tomb, thank God, you know, from the grave back he rose, victory over sin, hell, and, the de and death. 
He took it away from the devil and he went back to the Father. This is something to shout about on Christmas Day. Hallelujah. <clears throat> but why did, why did God send a baby? Why did he send an infant? Think about this. Woo, man, we got, where's, where's Shauna? And where's that baby? Ashlyn, I like that name. <laughs> that baby, when you look at that baby, or when you look at, when we looked at, 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 uh, at Mason, my goodness, Mason's seven months old. Yeah. He's a giant compared to this baby. Yeah. <laughs> but we see these things, we see these babies, you know, and the reality of it is that no matter how much we expect it, birth, new birth overwhelms us. Doesn't as moms and dads, does new birth overwhelm you? Yeah. yeah. And you know why aunts and uncles and church grandpas and grandpas and aunts and uncles from the church? They overwhelm us. Here we see nestled in the arms, you know, of a brand new mother of the human race here. We see the future in flesh. Our legacy to the world. Mason is a legacy. To this world. Yes. And we see this, and we see moms and dads, they check out their eyes, the baby, check the mouth and the ears, you know, and look to see, oh, he looks like me, and that looks like you, though he look like me, he looks like you. <laughs> you know? And really, in reality, he looks like JJ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got all the traits of mom and dad and the family. Yes. Praise God. You know, but most of all, silently, they're saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you for over and over again for such a, an amazing, wonderful child that you've sent to me. That's what, this, that's what Sean is saying right now. That's what Misty <laughs> said. That's what this church has said about Mason. You know? And Mary was the mother who wrapped the first Christmas gift. Thank God for that. Yes. What a blessing. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus' coming was foretold not by physicians, but by angels. Yes. Whoa. Can you imagine, Sister Misty, is an angel coming to you and passed it? Well, you know, God spoke to you, brother. That's right. I can't imagine that. <laughs> Amen. No. Here we see here, this is, there's, a, there's a starlight in the sky that came. This is the Messiah. He'd been the subject of poems and songs and, and talk about, you know, for thousands of years, the Messiah was coming. It's hard to imagine that a person would look so innocent like that baby would become the king of all kings. The one chosen would have had the wisdom of Solomon. People said he's coming as a commander. He's, he's going to have the wisdom of Solomon. He is going to have the, the charisma of David yeah. who slew Goliath. He's going to not only that, he's going to have the godliness of Moses and the military <coughs> genius of Joshua. He would arrive with a sword in his hand, ready to take the nations and his beloved people. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2. We're going to see exactly why he came. Let's look at how the scriptures define how the Messiah would come to the earth. We see in verse 9, chapter 9, verses 2. The people who walk, in, who walk in darkness will see a great light. Who's this great light? We're talking about Jesus. Yes. There's people that walk in darkness right now that have never met Jesus. They've never seen that light. And I would tell you right now, God's blessing every one of you for coming out on Christmas Day and being here. There's another church right down the street down there that are parking on the roads. Yeah. yeah. I know there's a lot of people that can't come on Christmas Day, and God knows the reason. But let me tell you something. There's a lot of people that won't come into this church today because they're walking in darkness. That's right. But here's what the scripture says. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, deep darkness meant there was a lot of death, depression, and things going on in those days. And it says, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. And like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery. Oh, this is cool now, folks. Listen to this. And let the heavy, lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod. 
How many of you are tired of people telling, telling, telling you you can't do this and can't do that because the Word of God says you can and you should be able to do it? Amen. That's right. Amen. I love the fact we have freedom of religion. Amen. The right one. I'm not religious. I'm just a born again child of God. That's right. And it says, just as you did before you destroyed the honored army of Midian. And this is the cool part. It goes on. It says, the boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. What the word of God is saying here, quit worrying about the battles and the wars that's going on. Look for Jesus. Jesus is coming. And then it says, well, wait a minute. How do you know that? Because it says right here, for a child is born to us. A son is given to us. A child is born. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful. Counselor, mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And his government and its peace will never end. Thank you, Jesus. Our government will end one day. The peace that we expect of these peace talks will never come until Jesus comes. Amen. In Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, it verifies exactly what I just read in Isaiah chapter 9. There was a baby, just a little bitty baby boy. He was in a stable in a manger. And they, Mary and Joseph, they understood that here this baby, who seemed at first glance just like any other baby, any other child, he cried in the middle of the night. Shana, does that baby cry in the middle of the night? I asked Gary the other day, should you get any sleep? Yeah, when a baby slept. <laughs> <laughs> he cried in the middle of the night. He was hungry. He needed fresh, clean, dry clothes. Like all babies do, I got to use this phrase that I, that I coined a long time ago. The only thing that a person that likes change is a wet baby. That's right. <laughs> and if it was just an ordinary child, though, folks, let me tell you this. If it was just a new addition to the family, how can you be one of those who had roots from the past? Just as the prophet Joel foretold. Just as the infant of the Son of God was coming. Just as this scripture just told us he was coming as a child. And we see also too that that virgin birth meant that he was going to be divinity. He was going to be divine. He, was, he came to earth from outside. Pure and clean. And he wasn't a product of this world like we are. He was Jesus. He was the Son of God. And we see in the same way this infancy, this child, is a very sign, a significance of his humanity. This baby named Jesus is one of every one of us. We have God living in us. Say, I got God living in me. You got God yeah. living in me. Hallelujah. Yeah, you do. You were born like that. God said, let's let make man in our lives. And the devil told him, if you eat down to that tree, you're going to be like God. Well, go figure. God already told him the word. He arrives from heaven, thank God, with perfection, with godliness, of which none of us are capable of doing. Yet he takes that full human journey all through life as that baby. That baby, he walks starts to crawl, he walks, he grows up like any other baby. So how could we follow his footsteps as a man if we hadn't seen him crawl like a child? How could we believe that he had undergone the temptation that we faced if he had bat bypassed all those difficult times just like we have? He was sinless. He was here to make the full sacrifice on my behalf and your behalf. Aren't you grateful for that this morning? I am. Yeah. I'm so grateful to the Lord. Thank for that. you, Lord. It would have meant very little to us if he had came from heaven fully as a form, as a man. You know, and just said, here are my hands, you know, nail them to a tree. You know, here are my feet, place them on the cross for I'm willing to die. But instead we see him as a child, a baby in a manger, 
and we see him as a t in the temple as a boy around the age of 12, and we see him growing up doing the Father's business, just like he told the Father, I come to do your will. Yes, Lord. And in Luke chapter 2, in verse 52, it tells us, Jesus grew up in wisdom, and he grew up in favor with God. And with all the people, we see Mary and Joseph, how amazed, can you imagine how amazed they were in their son? I mean, I know Mary, the mother, had, oh, this was the son of God. But how amazed they were at what was going on here. And see, in Matthew 13, we finally see him as a young man quietly beginning his ministry. That would change human history. When Jesus talked to the Father in heaven and said, I'm going. They were getting ready to change what was going to happen in history because of the sin that happened in the garden. We see this great baby grow. We see him, we see him wrestle with temptation just like we do. He wrestled with it just like any other man. We see he had love for children. We see that he himself knew how to love because he was a child. Yeah. I mean, those children just love everybody. Man, it's hard, you know. Don't take that toy away from them. Though. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> History is so full of people who claim they were from God or were God. And we hear that and see it all the time. Bah bah Buddha, Muhammad, you know, Confucius, Socrates, Jesus Christ. All of these have come and said, I'm from God. And even the 21st century uh, religious Claims like the Scientology. You know, they believe, okay, you know, they claim the answer to the, all the spiritual needs. Like we've got all the answers, you know. All you have to do is just find yourself. Yes. Man, if, Sister D, if I had to just look for myself, I'd be a lost person without God. Yes, that's right. And I just found out just today that, how I many knows there's a Star Wars religion? I mean, oh. God is my witness. Oh, in the Czech Republic, there's over 15,000 people that believe in the Force. <laughs> yep. I'm serious, they do. They believe in the Knights of Jedi. They believe in the Knights of Jedi. Lord Jesus. Oh, I mean, here, I don't know what they're doing today. You know, I don't know. Yoda's gone. Sorry. He's out of the picture. You know? And we see, you know, it surrounds us and it penetrates to us, you know. And he says, this is what happens, you know. Here we see that all of this is sitting around. Uh, all the force is coming from us and it makes the galaxy who it is. And we know the force, who the force is. We know where the power is coming from. It came from that baby boy that was born on Christmas Day as an infant baby and is, a, and is in heaven sitting on the right hand of the Father. That's right. Excuse me, Jedi Knight. <laughs> Lord I was amazed when I saw that. I could not believe my eyes. There are two kinds of tests to determine the authentic Christ. One of them is reason, and the other was history. Let me give you some examples here. And I'm going to try to hurry here. Reason dictates that if any one of these leaders, like Muhammad and Socrates and you know Buddha and Confucius, you know, Simon, Simon says, or whatever, you know. You know I mean, you might as well say Simon. If anybody's going to say that Star Wars, you know, Jedi Knight. If any one of them did come from God, the least thing God would have done, or their God would have done, was to support their claim, would be pre-announced their coming. If they were really from God. And the reason would dictate that, you know, there would be some definitions, you know. Where would this leader come from? Where was he going to? Why was he coming? Who would he come for? But we see none of this happened. Even diplomats today uh, have to have passports and credentials when they go into different countries to say, I am so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so. And, -so, and here's who I am. I represent so-and-so, the United States of America. They have to know, know this. Socrates... Mohammed, Buddha, Confucius, they had no one to foretell their birth. They didn't have anybody to pre-announce that they were coming. And they didn't have anybody to say that they had a father and mother and where the birthplace would be. None could 
validate like Jesus could that they were the unique Messiah or the man from God. But it was different with Jesus, thank God. It came all the way back from the prophets of the Old Testament, clearly defined from Genesis all the way to Malachi. The scriptures are full of it. To expect the Messiah to come from heaven, just as we read in Isaiah, thousands of years before it happened. And even John the Baptist. How many remember the story about John the Baptist? Yes. He announced, there's coming among you somebody greater, more mighty, more powerful than I. He made it clear that Jesus was superior and that Jesus was supreme. But it's clear to talk about the Messiah and his family. It would be, as clear as that can be, we got to understand that without his immaculate conception, he'd just be a regular old man. No. Regular baby. But we know his birthplace. We know why he came. These things were pre-announced thousands of years ahead of time. And what separated Jesus, thank God, from others, you might want to write this down, to all these so-called spiritual leaders was that Jesus expected when he came, he was expected when he came, he was longed for. People were looking for him. Why? Because someone had announced that he was coming. Just like this pastor in this church, Brother David back there, and some of you others that preach the gospel, announcing that, the, that Jesus is coming soon. They're proclaiming he's coming. Amen. Don't get discouraged. He's coming. He said he's coming. He came the first time. He will come again. Amen. He even said in the word, I'm the son of God. The Messiah, Jesus Christ. My father sent me. The word of God says that in Hebrews. And the human family today needs to understand that this young girl that drew that picture, all she was wanting to do is have, try to find a picture of Jesus. She wanted to know what he looked like. We have all an embedded desire within us to know what God looks like and who he is and what he stands for. And, you know, and because we want to embrace the son of the living God. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. The second distinguishing fact that separates Christ from all the others, from all of these Yahoos, Yahoos, <laughs> Yahoo, is that Jesus, when he came, he separated time into two different periods. The time that would be measured from Christ coming to earth, one period of time would be in the past, which would be before Christ in B.C., and the other period of time would be after Christ, after his death. So Buddha didn't shake time up. Muhammad didn't shake time up. They didn't change the calendar. And this guy called John Smith of the Mormon, he's a, you know, this guy is so good-looking guy that I've never seen a real picture of him. It looks like a drawing of him. You know, he didn't create two periods of time, but Jesus did it. Amen. The Son of God did that. No one can stand on their own references. They have to stand on God's time. And the third distinguishing fact that separated Jesus Christ from all the other claimants to, to be Christ and every other person that came in this world, they came in this world to live. Jesus came in this world to die. Amen. He was born to die. He was actually came in this world to die. The cross was a gold medal for Jesus. Yes. That was his goal and purpose, but that wasn't the end. And I want to, I love Christmas presents, but the real Christmas present is not under the tree. It was nailed to a tree, folks. Yeah. yeah. The story of every human life begins with that birth and it ends with death. But in the person of Christ, it started with his, it was his death that was first and his life that was second and yeah. last. Revelation 13, I want you to listen to what this says. We've read it before. And 18. It says, from the beginning of the world, he was slain to be like a lamb. He was slain. He was slaughtered. Jesus was slaughtered. And the, and the portrayal that Mel Gibson, who's a great director and, and producer uh, of, the, of the Passion of Christ, was likely nothing compared to what the Son of God had to go through. Here's a side of the Christmas story you haven't probably thought about or heard before. You maybe have, but those soft little hands that were fashioned in that little baby's hands. Little small, 
not even as big as my thumb. Those little hands, you know, they were formed in Mary's womb. And while they were made so that those huge nails, I don't know how big they were, could go through his hands, pierce his body, pierce his feet, those little pink feet, those little bitty feet that you stamp on that birth certificate, you know, those pink, pink feet of Jesus, you know, they, they couldn't really walk real good at first, and they crawled. But, you know, one day he would go up to a, a hill called Golgotha and be nailed to that tree. And that sweet infant's head, sweet as it could be, little hair, you know, Mason got hair growing all over the place now, you know. But they took that, those thorns and stuck it into his head all the way into the scalp, forced it into him. And his tender, soft skin as that baby would one day be ripped to pieces before he went to the cross. And by taking time to think about why Jesus was born to die, I believe we can come to appreciate more the real Christmas image. In Hebrews 2, we learn why the reasons we, we talked about why Jesus came. He tasted death for everyone in this world. Thank God. But Jesus also became flesh. And blood by being born of a human, even as a baby. For only as a human could he die. He could not just come as a man. It would have been presentable. Because he had to break the power of death over the devil. He was tempted, but he didn't sin. It was necessary in every respect for Jesus to become to come just like us in that human body. But yet he had deity. Hallelujah. If he had come as God and said, put me on the cross, it would have just been like a, it wouldn't have been convincing. If he had come as a man, he would have just been as a martyr. He came as a child to conquer. We trust him because he loves us. Yes, Lord. We love him in our hearts because we know that he, and only he, as that tiny baby in that stable, placed in the manger, wasn't, didn't come like a king, but he is the king of kings. Amen. Amen. I want to ask you today if you'd stand. You know, this is Christmas. Thank God. You know, I'm not, I don't want to embarrass anybody. <coughs> Nobody wants to be embarrassed either. I don't want to be embarrassed. But he went to the cross for you and me. I, I'd like to just take a, just a few minutes. And I know the pastor's going to pass out, pass the communion out. But if you would, just for a few minutes, if you would, right where you are, I want you to just take it just a time right now, consider the cross this morning. But every head back, every person just thinking about that baby becoming the man, you know, right where you stand, that can be your altar. We're getting ready to, to do communion. This is something that the Word of God says, do this as often as you should do it in remembrance of me. Not me, but Jesus. Right now, no matter what you've ever said or done or, or thinking about doing, from now to eternity, you can still make it right with God. No matter what. Might, it might be something small, might be something... If you feel like it's just so big and it just might be something that, you know, God knows your heart. And this morning, why don't you just ask the Lord. Whatever that situation is that you're facing, if you're facing financial or, or health problems or maybe it's just something that, you know, I've got a, I've got a situation in my life that I just need God to deliver me from. Why don't you just ask God to deliver you from that right now? He's still the King of Kings. He has a reputation of no other that's ever come. Aren't you thankful for the birth of Jesus? Yes, Lord. Aren't you thankful for the King and for the, the love that He's given us? Father, I thank you for sending your Son for us as I look across this congregation, for every person in here, 
and those outside these walls, every person that has been born and every person that will be born, that God, you've given all of us a chance to confess who you are in our hearts. And for that, God, you sent your son that we might be redeemed, washed in the blood of Jesus, and that one day we'll live with you forever and ever and ever and ever. That's what birthdays are for, Lord. I thank you for this birthday. I thank you, Lord, for this day. And I give you praise for it, Lord. And everybody said, Amen.